Good morning and welcome. Brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever we are worshiping from, we come together and worship as the body of Christ. So welcome today as we celebrate uh, through Calvary Church, Toronto. It is great to be together as brothers and sisters. I don't know about you, but uh, I've been taking personally and my family, taking personally the challenge to walk our block and to pray for our neighbors and the businesses in our area. So I hope that you've been able to do that. One of the things that came up this past week in our staff meeting was we'd love to hear some of your stories about what God is doing in and through those walks. Maybe he's opened up an opportunity to talk with one of your neighbors that you never met before. We'd love to hear those stories. So if you could, feel free to send us an email, send us a letter. Uh, I think you already know our email address. It's calvary at calvarychurch.ca. But you can also feel free to, if you don't have email, to send us a note in the mail or just drop us a line at the church at our phone number. Um, We'd love to hear those stories and to worship together and to praise the Lord for what he is doing already in our neighborhoods. Our call to worship today is found in Psalm 40. I was reminded this morning of just the power of these verses. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Thank you, Father in heaven, for hearing us. Thank you for lifting us up and setting our feet firm on the rock of ages. Thank you for putting a new song in our mouths and our hearts. May many today see and fear you and put their trust in you. Amen. Psalm 40, verse 16 and 17 says, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Oh, 
Good morning, everyone. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, great is your name. We praise and honor you in all you do. Father God, there have been times when we have lived for ourselves this past week. We have been selfish and have only thought about ourselves and our wants. We've also sinned against you and we need to turn from our own selfish desires and seek to live according to your will. Lord, we are sorry for our sins this week. We know that you are faithful and just to cleanse us from all our sins. We know that if you, we confess our sins, we know that you are faithful and just and will cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Father God, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. You have wiped our slates clean as far as the east is from the west. Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you for granting us the freedom to live in this country where we can worship and praise you openly without fear of imprisonment. Thank you for your answered prayers this past week. Father God, we continue to pray for our federal, provincial and municipal leaders as they continue to lead and govern us through this pandemic. Please give the, our leaders much wisdom as they look to start to lift these restrictions. Father God, we now think of those who are struggling with isolation at this time. Lord, we pray that you will comfort them in these times. And Lord, we lift up those who are putting their health on the line as they continue to treat those with uh, COVID in the hospitals. Lord, we know in these times that there are many who are struggling with financial issue as a result of their jobs not being restarted or being or currently still being furloughed. Lord, we pray for our friends and family around the world and those who are serving the residents in next door to our church. Lord, we continue to pray for our church leadership, the pastors, the board of elders as they continue to lead us through this unique situation. Lord, we continue to lift up our missionaries serving you around the world, and we pray that you would anoint our pastor as he shares your word with us. Finally, Lord, we pray for our offering. We ask that you would continue to bless it and multiply it for your purposes. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, kids. Have you ever heard the saying, don't talk the talk if you're not going to walk the walk? Do you know what that means? For a Christian, it means don't say that you believe in Jesus without doing what he says. You see, some people know all the Bible stories and they even memorize Bible verses. They know their Bible, but it doesn't affect the way they live their lives. They go out and say mean things about others or get really angry and yell when they don't get their way. The Bible doesn't make any difference in the way they live their lives. Today we're going to continue going through the book of James and this morning Pastor Daniel is going to speak about verses that say we are fooling ourselves if we know the Bible but not do what it says. James says that's like looking at ourselves in a mirror and then walking away forgetting what we look like. Can you imagine if I looked in the mirror and I saw that I had a little bit of broccoli stuck between my teeth, but I walked away without doing anything about it? That'd be ridiculous. And that's the same as reading the Bible, knowing what it says, but having it make no difference in the way I live my life. James goes on to say that <clears throat> when we read the Bible and actually obey it, that God will bless us. And that's what it means to talk the talk and walk the walk. Thank you, Wendy, for the excellent lesson this morning. Hey kids, I don't know if you recognize that laneway that Miss Wendy was walking down, but if you recognize it, how about you email her and tell, tell her where you think that it is? Now, did you catch that lesson? Don't talk the talk without walking the walk. Now, none of us have perfect memories. We all forget things, don't we? I do. One time I forgot where I left my car. Let me explain to you. I was a pastor at a downtown Ottawa church, and our church had a very small parking lot that was used for the staff during the week. And on Wednesday mornings, our staff was asked to move our cars onto street parking so that moms with babies could come and that they could come to Bible study. And after Bible study, we would go out around lunchtime, pick up our cars, bring them back into the parking lot. Except for this particular day, I'll tell you what happened. I went down the street and got in my car and started the engine, and all of a sudden I noticed that the gas light came on. And so I drove around the block, because everywhere downtown Ottawa has one-way streets, to come back to the church, and just before I got to the church, I saw an Esso station that has a Tim Hortons right across the street from the church. And I didn't normally get gas there, but this day, time I thought, you know, I might as well get it now. And so I pulled in, and it was a very busy, busy gas station. And so I stood in line, or I... I sat in line in my car until it was time for me to pull up to the gas pump and fill up. And so I did that. And then I went and paid for the gas. And then I thought, well, I should get a coffee. So I, I moved on to the, next, the other line to pick up a cup of coffee. Tim Hortons stood in line there, like I did every lunch hour, every day. You can see where this is going. And then I got my coffee, and absentmindedly walked across the street back to my office to enjoy my coffee. Hours later, yes, hours later, my intern poked his head into my office and said, uh, pa Pastor Daniel, can you take me over to Carleton University? That's where we had our campus church. I said, sure, I'll give you a lift. Walked with him down into the back parking lot, and I exclaimed as I walked out there, my car's been stolen. And he looked at me a little strangely. He was pretty sure that no one st stole my little Hyundai Accent, which didn't even have a radio. He, he, said, he says, I'm sure it's not stolen. It's Wednesday. Maybe you just left it on the street. And I said, no, I'm absolutely sure I went to, <gasps> oh no. And I ran all the way around the church and looked across the street and there it was sitting right where I left it, tank full of gas, cars pi piled up behind it, and I got there just in time because a police car had just pulled in. You know, sometimes being forgetful can be a little bit embarrassing, actually very embarrassing. 
I was very red-faced that day. And my intern wouldn't let me forget it. But can I just say something? As Wendy pointed out, there's a kind of forgetfulness that's a lot more dangerous than just forgetting where you parked your car. It's, here's what it is. It's listening to God's word and having the Holy Spirit convict us of something and then just walk away without changing anything. Forgetting everything that you've just heard. And that's exactly what James is talking about today. You see, the key passage in this entire book is in today's scripture reading. James chapter 1 verse 22, which says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, we've been in James' epistle to the church for the last few weeks. And we learned that for most of the book of James, it's a book about relationships. How to treat people the way that God wants his people to. As Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself and what that looks like. But first, James says, we have to do a spiritual self-check. Do you remember that? How we're going to see the trials that God's allows in our lives. Asking for his wisdom and his perspective on those trials. Well, last week, we learned that trials often lead to temptation. And perhaps this week, you've struggled to put last week's lesson into practice. To flee temptation. To get as far away from it as possible. And if that's you, if you've struggled with that this week, I'm so thankful for Michael, his prayer this morning. Because... We need to remember that as God's children, there is forgiveness at the cross of Jesus. He gives us a fresh start when we confess our sins to him, knowing that as we go forward, we can have his spirit's help and his family's help. But you know, James isn't finished with his self-examination. Next, he turns to the primary evidence of our new birth. The mark of a Christian. And in this final section of chapter 1, we learn that God calls us to practice what we preach. Or as Wendy said, not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk. But before we look into God's word, would you bow with me and pray? Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, This morning we come in thanksgiving for your holy word. Thank you for giving us your word. So that we can hear your voice speaking to us. And so help us today to receive what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. So that we can obey you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles with me if you have them and turn to James chapter 1. And we are going to be reading this time from verses 19 right through to verse 26. Follow along as I read. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, And slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
Now, do you see what James sees as the evidence of new birth? Obedience to the word is the mark of a genuine Christian. Verse 21 says that we're to get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent around us and humbly accept God's word planted in us, his trusted word, the scriptures he has left us, that in the end will save us when Christ returns. Now, that term, the word, is found multiple times in this passage. So does the word do or doer. And so the theme of this paragraph is very clear. Those who've experienced new birth by the means of God's word, as explained last week in verse 18, must accept it by doing it, by obeying it. As one of our pastors, one of my pastors from years ago, would say to us, don't act the way you used to act because you're not who you used to be. Well, now, what does obedience to the word look like? Well, number one, we take off the sin that is so deeply offensive to God. That's what it means to get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Some of you have heard of the famous landscape painter Bob Ross. And when I was a child, I took art classes from an artist who was very much like him. In fact, I think he was, might have even been better than Bob Ross. But this art teacher was also a chain smoker. He would start every cigarette with the one that he just smoked before. And sometimes he would ask me, a 10-year-old, to hold his burning cigarette as he would help me fix my painting. Now, this was long, to give my parents credit and him credit, this was long before adults knew the effects of secondhand smoke. But this is back in the 70s, and about eight of us kids would sit in this little tiny room with, with no windows open, and we would, our clothes would just absorb the toxic fumes. Now, I would come home just triumphant with my masterpieces. I still have a few of them around. And my mom would just meet me at the door, and she would tell me to peel off my clothes, put them in a basket so she could very quickly take them to the washing machine so that the pastor's home did not smell like cigarette smoke. Now, that's the exact image that James is using right here. He's talking about the image he's using is a peeling off clothing. We, we peel off our sin that's offensive to God. It's like repulsive, stinky clothing which we peel off. Except in this case, God doesn't just wash our clothes. He actually gives us a brand new set. Perhaps James had in mind Zechariah chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, where Joshua the high priest and Zechariah has this vision of, jo of Joshua the high priest standing before the throne of God with these filthy robes. Listen to what he says. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. That's the, that's the idea of taking off those dirty clothes. And James chapter 1 verse 21 says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. Peel it off which represents us turning to the Lord in repentance after the Holy Spirit has convicted us of our sin when we are confronted by it in God's Word. Now, that is only possible with the Lord's help. We cannot do this on our own. Last week, we talked about addiction and how we need God's help, and we need His family's help in overcoming it. Same here. James says that this moral filth or evil is so prevalent, it's all the way around us. It's everywhere that we look. The Bible pictures it like sin. It's like crouching behind the door like a, a vicious beast, just wanting to pounce on us. As soon as we walk in the door, it's waiting there to ambush us. Douglas Moo says, James warns believers that putting off sin involves a fight against a foe that takes many different forms. Like an army with many soldiers 
sin attacks us persistently and in many guises. Knock down one sin and another quickly rises, arises to take its place in the spiritual conflict in which we are engaged. In other words, as Christians, we can never let our guard down. And as I mentioned last week, we're not to live this in isolation, this Christian life in isolation. We are better together. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And that's why our men in our Bible study, when we're finished our Bible study, we divide into small groups of three to pray for one another so that we can stand firm together. Now, as we read just before James 1.22, James gives us an example that he keeps returning to throughout his book, that of becoming angry and spouting off our mouths. Now, perhaps this was a temptation that James' readers were going through because of the trials that we're in. We're not sure, but it seems like it. Well, is that a problem for Christ's church also today, who is also going through heavy trials? You bet it is. I've never known so many angry Christians, or I've never known of so many angry Christians than I've heard about these last two years uncontrolled anger, leading to uncontrolled speech. How often do we find ourselves regretting the things that we've said in the heat of the moment? And James says that human anger doesn't bring about a life of righteousness or godliness or Christ-likeness. Instead, he says, to obey God's word, we should put off anger. How? By being quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Can you imagine what the world would be like if every Christian was quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? I believe that our world would be a very different place. You see, that one step of obedience to the Word would revolutionize our world. I love the prayer of David, Psalm 141, verse 3, which says, this, and I often pray this, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So obedience to God's word involves us stripping off the sin that so easily entangles us, as Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says. But you know there's more, James says. Number two, we replace that sin by looking intently into God's perfect law. Did you see? Intently looking into God's perfect law. That's when uh, verse 25 says, that's what it says. It says, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that brings freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, will be blessed in what they do. And so that person who just casts off sin in their lives, must replace it with something far more powerful, or they will give in to that same sin over and over and over again. Same, uh, same thing. James says that we replace that sin by looking intently into God's perfect law. And when James speaks about God's perfect law, he isn't precisely talking about Moses' law, the law of Moses, although... It includes the law of Moses as interpreted and enhanced by Jesus Christ. Ultimately, it's looking into all of God's Word. And so, looking intently into God's Word is the opposite of looking, just looking into God's Word and immediately forgetting what it reveals. James says that doing that, as you heard Wendy say, is like looking at yourself in the mirror and forgetting what is revealed about you. Here's another example. When I was in Ottawa, our senior pastor, Rick Reed, did most of the preaching. And even though I loved filling in for him sometimes, I also loved hearing him preach. Great preacher. And I also enjoyed another one of the tasks that he gave me. Rick would give me his sermon manuscript either Thursday morning or Friday morning at the latest. And what I would do with that is I would work through it. 
and study it, writing study questions for our small groups. And so by the time Sunday morning rolled around, I would have his message that he had prepared internalized. And then I'd hear it preached twice, sometimes even three times, depending on how many services we had. So imagine my surprise, and this happened way too many times. Imagine my surprise when I was involved in pastoral counseling later in the week. Often people would come in, sit down in my office, and have the exact very sin problem that Pastor Rick had explained on Sunday morning. And they'd say, well, what does the Bible have to say about what's going on in my life? And I would be like, what? You were sitting there with me. Sometimes I even ask them, I, I wouldn't be scornful of them, but sometimes I would ask them to listen to the message again. I was incredulous. They hadn't listened to the word on Sunday, or they had listened to it, but it had never sunk into their lives. And you know, that happens to way too many people. God is speaking to them through his word, and they're forgetting what he's saying as soon as they walk out. People who merely listen to the word and do not do what it says, James says, are on dangerous ground. They are deceiving themselves. And so James says we're to humbly accept the word implanted in us. What does that mean, implanted in us? Well, remember last week we talked about Ezekiel chapter 36, and it says that God removes our heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh that he has planted in us spiritually his word by his spirit who dwells within us. Why? So that we are capable to understand and to respond to his words. But that doesn't happen automatically, as many people assume. We have to read. We have to listen to. We have to memorize. We have to meditate on God's Word. It's kind of like a cow that, that chews grass and, and regurgitates it and just chews it again and mulls it over. Same kind of picture, what we need to be doing with God's Word, ruminating on it, mulling on it. Humbly allowing God's Word and God's Spirit to internalize His Word into our lives. To apply it to our very lives. And that takes time, and that takes deliberate focus. So happy to hear one of our men this week share that God has led him to do that recently. To get back into studying His Word. To take the time to be in God's Word just to, to study it. To stick to it by internalizing the words that God's Spirit is speaking to him as he does, as he reads it. Transforming his life. And so that's what it means to look intently into God's perfect law that brings freedom. And then, when we do that, we do what it says. And we're blessed, James says. No, Jesus promised the same thing, Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Now, here's the third thing that James says about not just listening, but obeying God's word. And some of you, this third point may make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Number three, obedience isn't selective. We obey everything that God reveals to us through his word. James doesn't say, do the part that you want to do. Or do the part that makes you feel good. Just ignore the rest. He doesn't say that. He says, do what it says. You know, the early church that James was addressing was like many Christians today. They take what they like from scripture and they discard the rest. It's like a, a smorgasbord or, or buffet kind of obedience. Pick out what you like. Leave the rest. But you know, obedience to just some of Scripture is really disobedience. That's not the mark of a Christian. You know, there are so many examples of selective obedience among those who are claiming to be Christians today. And I am speaking to Christians and not non-Christians right now. But here's just a few of them. Anger. Anger. 
which leads to spouting off words that are mean and hurtful. James has just talked about that. Or believers marrying unbelievers in disobedience to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Or how about people succumbing to the love of money and worldliness in disobedience to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5? Or couples living together without being married in disobedience to the previous verse, Hebrews 13, verse 4? As a young pastor, I remember having to do something difficult, asking a young adult to step down from our worship team. He was, he was hard. He was one of our best musicians. He, a Bible college graduate, was openly living with one of the teenage girls who had just arrived in our city. She had just uh, started university. And my entire student leadership team knew all about it. I was the only one who didn't know, apparently. And I didn't know about it until her mom, who I knew, called me up and she asked me what on earth I was condoning. Now, what grieved me most was not the couple's reaction to my decision. It was the reaction of my student leadership team who took me aside and chastised me for what they called judging others. As my theology prof explained to them later at one of our retreats, there is a vast difference between judging and condemning people, which only God is allowed to do, and making a judgment about right and wrong. Calling people to obedience to the Word of God, not just the things that we feel like obeying. Now, James has selected three topics that the early church was really struggling with, and if James was alive today, maybe he could have chosen some different ones, or more even. But you'll notice in chapter 1 that James grows increasingly more specific in his call to appropriate God's word in our lives. Accept the word, verse 21, becomes do the word in verse 23, or verse 22, which becomes do the law, meaning the law of Christ. And then James says, let me give you some examples. Now, he's already spoken about the tongue in verse 19 and 20, a theme that he's going to keep coming back to verse, here in verse 26, and again in much of chapter 3 and even into chapter 4. And so we're going to get back to speaking about the tongue in, later in our series. But for now, James is saying in verse 26 that if you cannot control your tongue, you're deceiving yourself. A person whose religion or, or faith is genuine will reveal that by the things that they say. Or to put it negatively, James says that failure to control your speech means you're deceiving yourself into thinking that your faith is genuine. Yikes, that's harsh, isn't it, James? And James is not one to shy away from the truth. Next, James speaks about looking after orphans and widows. Now, in the ancient world, there was no social welfare. And if you were to look at society, widows and orphans were the most vulnerable. They were helpless to provide for themselves. In the Old Testament, Exodus 22, verse 22 says, Do not take advantage of a widow or an orphan. Now, the law specified that people were to go out of their way to help people like that, to provide for them. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 and 29 says that they were to store up food for the Levites who weren't allowed to own property, for foreigners who often had very little, the orphans and the widows, so that they would be fed and satisfied, and that the Lord would bless those who did that. And then we have Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, or 24, verse 11, which says this, Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Well, who are our most vulnerable people today? You know, we don't have to look very far. It's so wonderful to have some of our seniors here with us today from Nesbitt Lodge. But look to what's happened to our seniors in Canada. You know, in my neighborhood, last year, almost 50 
seniors died in one long-term care facility during a three-week COVID-19 outbreak. I thank the Lord so much that he prevented Nesbitt Lodge from having the same overwhelming casualties. But we saw long-term care homes all over our country, especially Ontario and Quebec, go through this. Multiple lives lost. But get this, just before COVID, Canada introduced legislation to make it much easier to euthanize our most vulnerable, to treat them as expendable. And with that attitude, it's no wonder we lost so many of them during the pandemic. And now, Canada is expanding very quietly during the pandemic. Not a lot of people have been speaking up about this. Expanding assisted suicide laws now to young people, to people with struggling with mental illness and depression, making it much easier. In fact, I read somewhere where our country is proud of being the most progressive country in the world and allowing people to commit suicide with their doctor's help. And this culture of death, it extends not just to our seniors, but also to the unborn. Did you know the most dangerous place for a Canadian child to be living right now is as a disabled girl in her mother's womb. And I'm not here blaming the moms. I am blaming all of us for allowing this to happen. You see, if we were to walk the walk, instead of just talking the talk, we'd be rescuing those, as Proverbs says, that are being dragged away to death. We'd be holding back those sla- staggering towards slaughter. We'd be using our democratic voices to speak up. We'd be supporting ministries that are supporting moms, vulnerable moms, seniors. Now, when I say things like that, people become angry. And they say, pastors are not supposed to be talking about politics. It's not, it's not about politics. It's about obeying God's word. Speaking up for the vulnerable. James closes his chapter by reminding the Christians reading his letter to keep themselves from being polluted by the world. And again, this is so relevant to us. As Christians, we have the responsibility to protect not just ourselves, but also our kids, our children, from pollution from the world. Spiritual pollution, including social media, especially the internet. I'm not talking about all social media and all of the internet, but certain things that are there. I appreciate this week the Queen, in her speech this week, spoke about adding extra measures in the UK to protect kids from accessing dangerous, explicit material on the internet. And one of the ideas that other countries have adopted is preventing access to explicit material without having a credit card. It's something very simple, which will protect a lot of kids from a very serious serious problem. The vast majority of explicit internet images and and content is normalizing violence against women. Now here's some good news. I found this out just last week. A similar bill is being introduced in Quebec or in Canada by a Quebec senator and once that passes Senate it's going to go to Parliament. They're going to send it to Parliament And interestingly, it isn't primarily Christians pushing for this. It is a strong core of feminists who recognize how dangerous this world is getting for women and children. And yet, according to James, Christians need to be the ones leading this charge in protecting those who are most vulnerable. Some of you may be saying, Pastor Daniel, are you done preaching? I'd say, yes, I'm done for this week. Because James has a lot more to say. But as we close, can I just ask you that question again? Are you talking the talk and walking the walk? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this morning we have a lot to think about. Help us not be selective when it comes to obeying your word. Help us read it 
internalize it, look intently into it, obey it by the power of your Spirit in us. In Jesus' name, amen. God inspired Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And in Philippians 1, 27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let us all rise and join in worship, declaring today we choose to actively follow our Lord and strive side by side with our fellow believers for the faith of the gospel. As we close today, I just wanted to uh, remind us all of the passage. Before I come to the benediction, I just wanted to read Psalm 122, which reminds us something that's very relevant to right now, today. 
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. And we know that no matter who is being affected over there in the Middle East, that we need to pray as Christians, we need to be praying for peace. Peace. And that the loss of life of lives over there will stop. Also want to close with this benediction today, which says this. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, and go in God's peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.